So inflation. So we live in, in, in interesting times, right? We're living in times that uh, I, I remember parallels to them. I lived through parallels to them during the nineteen seventies. But really, for a whole generation, uh, two generations, maybe inflation is weird. It's, it's, a, it's a foreign concept. It's never happened. Uh, interest rates have been zero for 12 years now. Before that, they weren't much higher than zero. Inflation has been a non-event economically, from an economic perspective, for a long, long time. And the Fed, I think, incorrectly has been deemed as this amazing uh, entity that has just managed to manage that economy beautifully and everything's gone smoothly and cool. You know, we had, we had Alan Greenspan and Bernanke and now, uh, and Janet Yellen and then Powell, and they've all been doing an amazing job. Uh, and uh, people are big fans of the Fed as a consequence. I think that's true across the board. I think there's very few, uh, they have been very few challenges to what the Fed have done uh, for many, many years. Now, I take a very different perspective. I think the Fed's responsible for slow economic growth. I think the Fed's responsible for the 2008 2009, uh, 2008 financial crisis. I think the Fed has done a disastrous job all of that period. And we did not see one manifestation of a bad job that the Fed does, which is inflation. There are lots of things you could screw up in the, that, that are not manifest in inflation. Uh, so really the question of the Fed is, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the economics of it, but, uh, and then we'll talk about, well, you know, should there be a Fed? What is the role of government vis-a-vis -vis economics? And uh, does that include a monopoly over the issuance of money, which is what the Fed has, and, and therefore the ability to control the economy vis a vis prices and vis a vis regulating the financial system? So, what is inflation? Um, I mean, I think we're all experiencing right now uh, what we call price inflation, prices going up with really no reason. Perceivable for it. We can understand, like, uh, Putin invades Ukraine and the price of oil goes up. That makes sense for all of us, right? Because supply has been constrained, demand is still the same. You have the same demand, small supply, whatever its prices, they go up. But that wouldn't cause inflation. That would cause prices of oil to go up. Now, why wouldn't it cause inflation? Because if you have a set amount of money, chasing a set amount of goods, if the price of one good goes up and therefore I can afford less of it, what's going to happen to prices elsewhere? I'm spend, let's say I'm spending and I'm more money in oil, then what happens, and I've only got a certain amount of income, then what happens to my consumption of other things? It goes down. And therefore that's going to have to be reflected in the prices of all those things. So, therefore, so, so that's what we call relative price movements. Relative price movements get impacted by supply shocks, by things like war, by embargoes. You can have a relative price movement where the price of all goes through the roof and we have no inflation. So something else is going on here. People blame supply chain. Remember, that this was all about supply chains. It was all about the difficulties of getting goods from China to the United States. But again, you have to ask yourself, okay, I get why that is being constrained, but why are all these other prices going? Why isn't there again? This relative price movement. Okay, I spend less stuff in China, or I spend more money in China because those, you know, supplies constrained, so uh, prices go up. But then I should spend less money on the other stuff, and then prices should go down. So at the end of the day, something else has to go on for there to be sustained inflation. That is, prices going up throughout the economy, not just oil. Not just stuff in China, but also rents and real estate, and uh, I don't know if you still buy college textbooks or whatever. All this stuff would be bought. Seems everything seems to be going. And the question is, when does that happen? How does it happen when everything goes up? Which is what we characterize as price inflation. Again, it, measuring inflation is tricky. You know, you have to be curious of how people measure inflation. We can talk about it, but the way they, we you know, one measure inflation, which is popular that they distribute, not the one the Fed looks at, but the one that uh, people see is called CPI, uh, the consumer price, consumer price index. And basically what they do is they take a basket of, of the goods that they think the average consumer consumes, and they figure out how that changes in prices over time. 
Now, there is no such thing as an average consumer. So every one of us, in a sense, experiences inflation differently because our basket of goods is different. So not all baskets of goods are going up at the same rate. Does that make sense? All right. So what would cause all these goods to go up in price? Not just some. Well, what causes prices of anything to go up? Increase demand. If suddenly we all decide we're moving to you know, name the little town anyway, and we all show up and demand real estate, we want to buy what's going to happen to local real estate prices. They're going to go up. I, I, I live in uh, Puerto Rico. And uh, over the, the last five years, Puerto Rico has experienced that, right? A bunch of Americans have showed up, many of them before the current crisis, many of them with crypto money. That is with all feeling like they're gazillionaires. And they say, we want to buy the best properties on the island. And guess what happens to the best properties on the island? All of them. Went through the roof. All of all prices of real estate just went up. Not low end, not medium end, because that's not where the demand came from. Demand for high end, those all went up. So suddenly people demand not just real estate, but they demand everything more. They start consuming more. And you know, we haven't had time to produce more. Then what happens? Prices, prices go up to reflect that increased demand. Typically, prices go up. What will happen to demand once prices go up? It'll drop. And therefore, prices will probably stabilize and you won't see sustained inflation. So sustained inflation, but right, constantly going up, means that I demand stuff, you raise your price, I keep demanding it. I keep buying the same amount, and you raise it again, I keep demanding it. So the question is, how can I right, Where am I getting my money from? How can I keep demanding stuff? No matter what price you set, I keep demanding more. And the only way that can happen is somehow I'm getting more and more money. And to start the stock, what usually happens is something like what happened during COVID. Everybody getting a check from the government. We all got money. We all suddenly had a little bit more. We all took that money and went out and demanded and bought stuff. That raised the price. But where did the second wave come from? And the third wave and the fourth wave? Well, those come now from, okay, now, price has gone up. They go to my employer and say, listen, buddy, price is going up. I want a raise. So my wages are going up. So I have money. And where, did, where does my employer, how can they pay me? Because they're raising prices. So the whole thing becomes the circle of uh, you stimulate demand by sending people checks. Suddenly people feel flush. They go out and consume it. That raises prices. Now, when I send the check, where did that come from? That check that we sent everybody. If that check had come from taxes, if I sent you guys checks, but I tax those guys over there, then the net demand would balance out because their amount of wealth would shrink. Your amount of wealth would increase. Consume more, they would consume less, no inflation. But if instead of taxing it from them, I just print it, now there's actually more money in the system. And with more money in the system, chasing the same number of goods, you get higher prices. And that's what the Fed, that's what happened, right? When um, when uh, COVID stimulus happened, first under Trump and then under Biden, uh, the government basically printed money on a large scale and didn't see governments have printed money in the past during financial crisis, they printed money, but then they kind of hit it. They, they, they do the shell game where they, they, they print money, they give you money, and then they you, you know you put it away in some account where you can't touch it. You don't actually consume, which is called bank reserves. But here, they have to be sent you a check home. So what are you going to do? You're going to spend it. And as a consequence, it manifested itself in price. Built it through the system, and prices are going up. And prices continue to go up because wages continue to go up because employer employees are demanding higher wages. Unemployment is very low. Uh, employers don't have a lot of bargaining power. And employers raise prices so they can pay the employees more, and then employees have more money and they 
few more, we fix the price it, and you can see how this gets out of control. This is why people talk about, if you listen to the news, they talk about inflation expectations. It's not just about money you print, it's what people are now expecting in terms of prices, people are now expecting in terms of wages. And of course, we know that our government continues to print money. We know that we are running ever more larger deficits, although Biden just came out and declared that they've cut the deficit more than any other administration ever, right, between last year, I guess, and this year. But uh, Obama did exactly the same thing after the two, after his, uh, he had a big stimulus package in 2009, and then when the stimulus was gone in 2008, he said, see, I had the deficit, because I didn't spend that trillion dollars I spent last year as a one-off. Biden is doing exactly the same thing, but the deficits are still huge. Every one of those deficits have to be funded somehow. Ultimately, they fund them through printing money. So that's where inflation comes from. It comes from the printing of money. Who prints the money at the end of the day? In our system in the United States, because we have a, a Federal Reserve Central Bank that is supposed to be independent. In a, how independent it really is, it's supposed to be independent. What the government does is the government just sells bonds. So how do those bonds become, in order to finance its deficits, how do those bonds become money in the hands of people? Oh, who buys those bonds? What well, used to be the Chinese would buy our bonds, and the Japanese would buy our bonds, and the Dutch and the British would buy our bonds. We would buy maybe our own bonds. But there's so much of this stuff that we can't even, we can't, the Chinese have stopped buying it the Japanese don't buy many American bonds anymore. So who's buying it? Government. Yeah, so the Federal Reserve buys it. So not the government. So it's like the Federal Reserve taking, it's like the government has two pools and they're shifting between the two pools, right? So the government issues bonds. The bonds go to the Federal Reserve and the Federal Reserve sends money. And that's how you mod what they call monetizing the debt. That's monetizing the debt. That's turning bonds into Caps, new caps, it didn't exist before. This is, they talk about the Fed having a balance sheet and a very large balance sheet. That's all the bonds that they bought, which is huge. It's like uh, eight times greater than it was before the financial crisis. It's three times greater than it was before COVID. So they need printing money like crazy. And as they shrink, what they're trying to do now is shrink the balance sheet. What happens when you shrink the balance sheet? You sell the bonds, and the Fed Reserve takes the money. What does it do with that money? In a sense, it burns it. So money's gone. That's how you can take money out of the economy. So the Fed is constantly manipulating the amount of money we have to trade with in the economy. And therefore, the amount of demand that we can, as a, as a whole, um, uh, create. But it, it really is determining the amount of literally money that's in our pockets and in our bank accounts. And that institutions can use. And it's constantly doing that by buying and selling these bonds and by setting interest rates. The higher the interest rate, the more other people are willing to buy down bonds, the Fed doesn't do it because the higher the reward for them. So that is a way for them not to have to monetize the debt. The, the lower you know, the lower the interest rate, so less demand from outside, the lower the interest rate, the more the Fed is probably buying it on the debt. Um, higher the debt, the less economic, the higher the interest rate, so less economic activity. Why? Because it costs me a lot of money to borrow money to borrow. And if I borrow less, and if I consume less, I can use less, I invest less, because I can't borrow it as much because interest rates are high, the economy starts slowing down. Uh, and when the economy slows down, we consume less, and that forces prices to come down. If the economy slows down, what happens to unemployment? It goes up. What ha- when unemployment goes up, what happens to the bargaining power of employees? It goes down. So I can't bargain anymore. So I accept the wages I have, I cut my spending, and inflation comes down. That's the logic of what's going on right now. They're trying to create a recession. Purposeful, they're trying to slow down the economy, and the economy is already growing at less than 1%. So they're trying to slow down the economy, ultimately create a recession. So there's unemployment, so there's less consumption, there's less demand, therefore, quite a stop price. And wages stop stop. Think about the power that that gives our political class and the Fed. 
It's power over all of our lives. Basically, we've handed the Federal Reserve this ability to control our supply and our demand, to control maybe the most important price in the entire economy. There's so much more price than interest rates in the entire economy. To control the amount of money we have. To control, in a sense, every aspect of our economic you know, life. When there's a recession, when there's a boom, when money's cheap, when money's expensive. It's the only product that we have, money, which we basically national. We've given a, a bureaucratic organization the authority to determine how and what we use, how this money is denominated, how much there is of it, and how we use it. That's a lot of power. I don't think people quite appreciate, you know, uh, we always criticize, often criticize the Soviet Union, uh, oh, the old bread lines. Why were there bread lines in the Soviet Union? People standing, waiting for bread. Anybody else? Government actually was controlling the price. I mean, collect the farm to control the supply. The government is controlling the price. And when government controls the price, the price is always wrong because they don't have the inputs necessary to match supply and demand. So the government, if the, if the government sets the price low, how much of a product do you think is produced? If I told you you have to produce bread and I'm only selling it for 50 cents, you can only sell it for 50 cents. You're not going to produce anything. So supply shrinks as the price, as the government sets price controls low. If the price is set high, what happens? Everybody can use it, but nobody wants to buy it. And the beauty of a marketplace is that somehow we walk into the grocery store and there's almost always bread there, right? And always the price will be really paid for. And that supply and demand is always matched. And that has to do with the entire supply chain having prices and all the pricing integrating all the information necessary to make the bread and deliver it to the supermarket for us. When you have central planning, that whole pricing mechanism go away. Some bureaucrat has a model. The model says, by the way, be X. He plugs in X and he tells everybody this is the price of bread. No real information is being derived from movements in prices. And you get either shortages or oversupply. Always. Same thing is happening at the Fed. They've got vast models, massive models. Models, by the way, that never didn't predict inflation because that was a spice to them. But models that they keep tinkering with with the expectation of, oh, if we tinker with this or tinker with that, we can get a recession just right. Oh, we can avoid a recession that reduces inflation. Oh, we've got central planners, again, setting prices and expecting them to get it right. They couldn't get it right for an easy product like bread. Bread is relatively simple. In the Soviet Union, they never got the prices ready right. Yet, we are demanding that our central bankers get the price of money, which is like a million times more complicated, right by setting the interest rate and by determining how much money they have. I think there's a general principle here, we'll, we'll get to my approach to how to come to it, but the general principle is central planning doesn't work, never has, doesn't work for bread, doesn't work for interest rates, doesn't work for money, and indeed the history of the Federal Reserve is the history of disaster after disaster after disaster. Federal Reserve was established in 1914, the first big crisis it faced was the stock market collapse of 1929, which the Federal Reserve, based on most economists, not all, but most economists, the Federal Reserve completely screwed up and took a drop in the stock market and a model recession and turned it into a depression. And we got a depression. 1960s and 70s, we got inflation. Since then, we've got a business cycle. It goes up and down. We've got a financial crisis. All of those, you can put at the feet of the central planners at the Fed. And I'm not saying they're bad people. You think I'm adding economic theories, but it's not even that. If you can give them the best economic theory in the world, you can give them the best algorithm, the smartest AI, and certainly by an economy. And that's exactly what they're trying to do. So, from an economics perspective, purely economics perspective, they've got an impossible job. And I don't think there's an easy fix. People suggest rules, 
um, uh, you know, so to take away the discretion, so to take away the political manipulation. Rules are better than what they do today, but rules based on what? And again, it's a form of civil plan. And the question partially is, why does a central planning work? And, and one reason is this problem of calculation and the fact that we don't have a market that's advisory. But the other issue is, what does central planning assume? What is behind any form of, of central planning? Oh, you know, in a, in a bigger picture, you can generalize it more. Why do we have a government? What's the purpose of government? There's a lot of students you should know. What's the purpose of government? To organize ourselves. Yeah, so to organize us. So the purpose of government is to organize us. Which means that people in government know how to do that. In other words, they know what's good for us. They know what our values are, and they know what kind of lives we should live. And they are the small ones, and we are a little dumber, and they're going to organize us and tell us how to live our lives. And that's a common view of what the government should do. It goes back to, to Plato's Republic. Plato wanted to organize us a lot more than the U.S. government organizes us, but he wanted to organize every aspect of your life. He, you know, Plato was going to have the philosopher kings choose who he should marry. The philosopher kings were going to choose your profession. The philosopher kings were going to... Because you were in a cave. I don't know if you read Plato, but you were, you were in the myth of the cave, right? You were in a cave, you see shadows, you don't know the truth. Only the philosophers know the truth. They will dictate your life but that's the idea of organizing our life for us. I don't need anybody to organize my life. I do a pretty damn good job when I do my own. So what do we need government for? What are the common views? Uh, protection. Yeah, so we need government to protect. And I would argue that that's the only thing we really need, in, in a sense, the only thing we really need government for is protection. It's more complicated than protection because it's law and, and the, making that protection objective, which is, which is not easy and not simple, but it is fundamentally, ultimately, protection. What facilitates human well-being? What is it that makes it possible for human beings to thrive? Stability. What's that? Stability. Stability. Uh, so I'm looking for something uh, more fundamental than that. So in a social environment, even as individuals, what, is, what, what do we need to do in order to survive and provide us human? Or you can ask another question. What makes us human? Don't say that. What makes us human? What allows us to survive as a biological entity called Homo sapiens? Rationality or reason? Yeah, our, our ability to think, our ability to reason, our ability to use our mind to figure out what is good for us and what is bad for us, what you know, what's going to lead to death and what's going to lead to life at the very base. How that anybody here have the gene for hunting, gene for agriculture? I mean, even the base. You might be good at, it, but you might not have the gene. You good at it. the hunting or the agriculture. <laughs> <laughs> if you if, if if I take any one of you and drop you into the middle of the Amazon, there's only one thing, there's one fundamental thing you have to do in order to survive. If you rely on your genes, if you rely on your instincts, you will die very quickly. What's the one thing you have to do in order to survive in the Amazon? One thing. 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 Figure it out. Solve problems. So we go back to hunting and agriculture, right? Yeah, but, you know, we're pretty pathetic species. We're slow, we're weak, we don't have claws, we don't have fangs. Go run down a bison and eat and bite into it, right? You're not going to do that. So, so how are you going to survive as a human being? How, how, do, how do we get bison burgers? Do they have bison burgers? Yeah, maybe. How do we get them? Well, we have to apply them. We have, to, we have to build traps, we have to build weapons, we have to strategize as a group, we have to hunt. But to hunt, we have to, we have to go through cognition. We have to go through a process of reasoning. Same with agriculture. Nobody is born with the knowledge 
that a seed turns into a plant and you have to water it, you have to use fertilizer. All of that is discovered knowledge. All of that requires somebody to think, somebody to figure it out. So the fundamental way in which human beings survive is by using their mind. And I would argue that the fundamental way to achieve happiness, to achieve anything in life as a human being, is ultimately by using your mind. I mean, you have to act on it, but you have to start by actually being able to think it through. Choose your values, and then to a path to achieve those values. What's the enemy of that? What's the thing that makes your thinking irrelevant? And ultimately, you won't even do it. What would I do to you to make your thinking grow? Short of sure killing. What's that? Frighten us. Yeah, frighten you. And what's the most frightening thing I can do to you? Frighten my wife. Yeah, violence. Violence is the most, you know, because I, I could have gotten back into your head. Reason is out. It's not about reason anymore. You're surviving my defense and following my orders. If I tell an entrepreneur, this stuff over here, I don't know, stem cells, never going to be approved by the FDA ever. You can do all the research in the world. You can do, then he's not going to even do it. No venture capitalist is going to invest in it. You, you shut down a whole field of human endeavor by using basically violence. We're not going to allow it. Right? Who asked you? We're not going to allow it. That's a threat. That's a threat to your life, that's a threat to your livelihood, that's a threat that limits where you're going to devote your attention, where you're going to devote your reason, your thinking, your rationale. So human beings by themselves, as individuals living alone, we've got the beings, right? There's nobody to force them. But once we get into groups, some people want to force other people to do stuff. That's just the reality of life. There's always going to be some people who want to use violence one way or another to force us to do something. Now, sometimes the violence will manifest itself in just pulling out a gun and sticking it to your head. Sometimes the violence will manifest itself in fraud, which I consider violence, right? Fraud is a way of getting something from you through deception. And sometimes the violence will, will manifest itself in this group voting to take the stuff from this group. Call it democracy. But democracy can manifest itself in violence just to ask Socrates, right? Why did Socrates die? Because he was doing what I do, is uh, corrupting the youth, <laughs> challenging the fundamental beliefs about gods, about morality, about all these things. And the citizens of Athens wouldn't tolerate that, so they got together and they voted basically, put it in trial. It was basically a democratic vote. The silence, there's not free speech in democracy, pure democracy. So, when we get together in a group where we want to agree on the one thing that is most important if we're going to survive to agree on is no violence, no coercion, no force. And we need an institution to be able to, you know, make sure that that indeed happens. And that's a government. And that's the purpose of government. Should be the purpose of government. Has to be usually the purpose. Usually governments do the opposite. Usually governments are a way for some people to attain power over other people. But the ideal of government is to eradicate force from human interaction. So as individuals can use their minds as individuals in pursuit of their own values free of force, coercion, authority, free of people kind of forcing their way into their lives. What's the, what's the concept, if you will, to, I guess the constitutional concept that captures this idea that, uh, that you should be free of coercion, you should be free of violence, free of force, and that the government's job is to protect you. Well, the government's job is to protect you. But what, what is the concept? They captured this idea of freedom, the freedom of the individual to pursue his own life. Right. Right. I mean, that's what individual rights are. The right to life, what's the right to life mean? That you have to have to be careful. But what does right to life mean? From a philosophical perspective, from a locking perspective, and I think from the founding father's understanding of it, the right to life means you have a right to make decisions about your life. You have a right to, to, to figure out how you want to live, go live it. 
It's freedom. Freedom of what? Freedom from force coercion, fraud. And what's the role of the government? Protect that life. In other words, protect your freedom to act free of the coercion. Not to be the entity of coercion, but to be the entity that extracts coercion from society. The way to liberty is the right to think, to, to write, to, uh, to lecture, to, to talk about ideas. We are coercion, we are force. You know, the way to pursue happen. And there's no philosophy kings in the, in the Declaration of the There's you, as individuals, living your life based on your own mind. It's no accident the Declaration comes after the Enlightenment or during the Enlightenment, right? It comes during the period where the idea of reason, the idea of rational thought is elevated in human experience. And that's the only way we know knowledge. It's the only way we can decide on our values. It's the only way we should shape our lives. And all the government is there to do is to protect that ability. And not tell you what you can and cannot consume, what you can and cannot invest in, what you can and can, cannot do with your life. That's the opposite. That's the violation of rights. That's the government using coercion against you. And in that sense, if you hold that kind of view of the government is there to protect us, protect our freedoms, protect our rights, to protect us from coercion and force, then what role would the government have in money? None. I mean, it's sad that they even included it in the Constitution. It would be nice to just exclude it. Um, but even then, it's, it's about the it's about minting of, but not setting the value of. It's about very basic, simple things that they were supposed to do, not manage an entire financial system as they do today. Certainly not have a simple bank that basically has monopolized all money. And where if I were to stop, you know, I mean, people are trying now with Bitcoin and crypto to have their own money, and we'll see how long the government lets them do that. Right now, the market itself is imploding, so the government doesn't have to do anything. They just have to sit back and wait as the crypto bubble collapses. But if Bitcoin actually took off, is there any doubt that the government would shut it down, use coercion to stop it? Because the government has a monopoly over money. But where did it get that? That scores, and that's force. That's telling me what I can and cannot do. So, in my view, the government has no role in our economic life. And that's a pretty big statement. An ambitious statement. No role in our economic life. Other than help define and protect property rights. Property rights can be tricky. Uh, intellectual property rights are tricky, uh, property rights on the web are tricky, even figuring out exactly where the fence is, exactly where the property line is, as you probably know some property dispute between neighbors, is not always straightforward. The role of the government is to help, de help define them, and then and be the arbiter of, of the so we don't duel the streets, but we use a court system in order to arbitrate and, and have objective rules on how to, how to do it. But other than that, the government has no business in our economic lives. And as soon as it tries to step into our economic lives, it's using force, it's using coercion, it's imposing its will on us. And, and the Federal Reserve, again, is a good example. The Federal Reserve was established in 1914 because politicians were pissed off that in the big financial crisis of 1907, read about this, big financial crisis, a lot of banks failed, there's a lot of problems, the US economy looked like it was on the brink of a depression. J.P. Morgan, a private banker, stepped in, got all the other bankers in New York together, locked them in a room, and they sat down, they figured out a solution, they solved the problem, they basically helped some banks got dissolved, other banks got bailed out, but it was all done privately. No government bail. And it was resolved. And a lot of politicians were really upset because how come private interests it has so much power? So uh, they had hearings, and the consequence of those hearings was ultimately the establishment of a central bank that takes away the power from JP Morgan and gives it to a bureaucrat, a, 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 somebody appointed by the government to control all of this. So you get 1913, you get hearings, 1914, you get the Federal Reserve. Uh, and uh, yeah, the 
power of private bankers has shrunk dramatically as a consequence. Uh, and then you get, and then in the 30s, you get massive banking regulations with you guys, the securities law, and you know all the 33 34 securities and bank laws. And since then, it's piling regulations by regulations by regulations by regulations. And what are regulations? You know, attempts to, on a localized basis, centrally plan human beings. There are ways to, they, they'll argue it's ways to fix market failures, but they're never ways to fix market failures. They're ways to actually create more failure in the future. I don't know if single regulation has actually fixed a so called market failure. And you can see the pilot on. If you study securities regulation, it's just, it's just layers. One on top of the other of more regulation, more regulation, trying to fix the problems that the previous regulations created. And as part of that, you know, in my view, there, there should be no Federal Reserve. I mean, the issue of money and the issue of what money should be and the issue of all of that should be up to us in a marketplace. What do we demand? Now, historically, we demand gold as money. That was the kind of standard. Maybe in the future it'll be Bitcoin. I don't know. I doubt it, but maybe it would be Bitcoin. Whatever it is, why is it any of some central planners' business? Unless they're trying to organize society. In other words, pursue their so-called common good, public interest. When I hear common good, public interest, I want to run for the hills. Because that always is code for they want to control my life. They don't trust me to choose my own values. They don't trust me to live my life the way I see fit. They want to impose the will on me in excuse of, yes, you might be hurting right now, but it's good for everybody. How do they know that? How do they measure it? It's the whole problem of utilitarianism. How do, we, how do we figure it out? It's impossible. It's just a way to control. It's just a way for power. So you can tell your uh, Fed side, I think he's a Fed side professor, at Harvard, Vermeule, Vermeule, yeah, Adrian Vermeule, more dangerous than anybody in the world in terms of wanting to control our lives. Once you start interpreting the Constitution not as protecting individual rights, but as protecting some kind of common good that nobody can define except the people in power, you're heading towards a disaster. But that's where, unfortunately, I think much of the American right seems to be heading this Oh okay, yeah, I'll uh, I'll take any kind of questions you guys want on this or anything else. Yeah. So I'm gonna agree with you on almost everything. Almost. But uh, you know, just in practical reform, and, and as we look forward, uh, you know, we had for a good number of years Greenspan, that a, a follower of uh, of Ayn Rand, a betrayer, a claim of oh, betrayer. Uh, and, and during, that, during that time, uh, Friedman uh, and, and others, uh, uh, I was less comfortable with it, but Friedman proposed, you know, you do some sort of Friedman rule, you do a mm -hmm. formula, you have it, less discretion, no Fed. You seem uncomfortable with this. Wouldn't this be a better, at least, transition proposal? No question. So if you had to choose how to run the Fed today, given that there was a Fed, yeah. Then uh, a rule based Fed is much better than a discretionary Fed. A discretionary Fed is ultimately um, a politicized Fed. We saw, we've seen how Powell and Settle in 2018, when Powell wanted to raise interest rates and Trump brought him in, yelled at him, and suddenly interest rates were going down. Um, you've seen that many times in history. For example, interest rates never go up during a presidential election. You can go back and check. No Fed increases interest rates during a presidential election because they don't want to play politics. Um, they come down during President Hill. Yes, so in, in uh, 1992, they started decreasing interest rates just a little too late for George Bush. That's what Clinton won. One quarter too late. If they started a quarter earlier, Bush would have won. That was the election where it was the economy stupid. Uh, it's the economy stupid. So, yes, yeah, so a rule would be better than discretion because I don't trust discretion. You know, the Federal Reserve is the largest employer. PhDs in economics and of economics in the world. And I don't why I don't trust. I mean, as somebody who is somewhat of an economist, I'm a finance guy, I don't trust these economists. And and but they all get PhDs out of schools, they all have to write the same kind of dissertations, they all have to pretend to 
hold the same kind of views because the largest employer of PhDs in economics has a particular view of the world and you benefit in. So you don't get much dissent inside of that. You don't get much interesting things. So the problem with the rule, of course, is which one does it really work? For how long does it work? What about in crises? It's too easy to violate the rule of crisis. Um, so, yes, better, but not the solution. And it's interesting because uh, when Trump um, Trump got to nominate a, a, uh, a Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve Chairman, he used a lot of appointed Powell in the first round. And he had a choice between Powell and, uh, and John Taylor. John Taylor is an economist from, uh, from Stanford University, very, very well regarded, fairly free market, let's say, uh, generally, so it's a free market. But Taylor has a famous rule named after him. It's called the Taylor Rule, which is the rule for monetary policy. It's a rule for how the Federal Reserve should behave. So basically, Trump had a choice between rules guy, the discretionary guy. And I, I, I remember at the time I said, it's not this way to be the pick. There's no way, no, and, and it's not to Trump, but any president, he's not to pick a rules guy because then he has no power. Or at least, you assume he has no power. He picks the discretionary guy because he can influence it. This is the problem of politics and economics, one of the many problems. Is it's not about economics, it's about politics. All of these things are about politics, not economics. So he picked power because he could easily manipulate power. John Taylor would have said, follow the rule, you know, and, 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 it, and long term it'll work. Now, it's a real question. I think John Taylor's a good guy, but the real question is whether under that kind of political pressure, would a federal chairman stick to the rule or not? I think, you know, that's the action you determine. Alan Greenspan in the end. And didn't. I think Alan Greenspan was following some kind of rule in, in the 90s, but then in the 2000s, he abandoned it. And then we got, and I think as a consequence of his abandoning it, we got the financial crisis. Yeah. He was following the Taylor rule up until yeah. 2000. 2001, 2, when he abandoned the Taylor rule after 9 11. And by abandoning the Taylor rule after 9 11, it created the economic, uh, the, the interest rate and economic environment that led to a financial crisis. And whether it was a Taylor rule or whether it was a gold price rule, I mean, it, it looks like a Taylor rule exposed, but it's not clear that's what he was actually doing. He might have just been talking about gold prices, which would be consistent with his writing earlier. Uh, hard to tell, but he abandoned it very quickly when, 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 uh, when he needed to, which was after 9 11, when he thought he needed to, which was after 9 11. So the, the banking background, so the study, you know, SEC, federal regulations, et cetera. I'm curious what your opinion is on you know, the benefits of some sort of market security regulation protecting investors versus the downside of, you know, like the company distracts them from the actual business purpose. So I'm a, I, believe in, I, I believe in regulation, but I believe that the best way to regulate business is the market. And businesses themselves, kind of what we call voluntary uh, regulation. So, for example, securities regulation, uh, which I think is a disaster and a mess. I mean, I, I one of the things I do is I run a I run a hedge fund, and it, it used to be in the nineties that what differentiated a hedge fund from a mutual fund was a hedge fund was unregulated. I believe, I mean, they could do anything pretty much, and that's not true. Anymore. I have to regulate what the SEC and they monitor anything that you do and you have to file all these things. And, but for, for, you know, and there's so much paperwork that we have to do. We have a full time compliance officer for a small little edge fund, which is insane. And the, the, the paperwork and the restrictions and the constraints of what we can say, whether we can do social media, can I tweet about my fund? And then who can I accept money from? Like, unless you have $5 million of investable securities, right? Liquid assets, you can't invest in my fund. So my fund is for rich people only. And people complain about inequality, right? If you're middle class, you can't invest in my fund. If you're poor, you can't invest in my fund. By law. Right? Even if you're really in smart, even if you're a PhD in finance, and you can, I mean, this is the stupidity of it. It's one size fit all. Whereas I think what would actually happen, because it, it's true that if you had no rules, it, it would be crazy. And I think fewer people would participate in the markets, and people would be afraid. Like, let's say you had no exact trading in the market. Talk about insider trading, it's an interesting topic in law school. But 
I, you know, if you had no insider trading, then a lot of people would say, oh, I, I don't want to trade because I might be trading against somebody with insider information and so on. Well, what is the market mechanism to solve these guys? And this is the thing. There's always a market mechanism. If there's something with straining our ability to do something, there's a profit opportunity there for somebody to come in and set this story right. So who has an incentive to regulate financial activity with, where it wouldn't be regulation by courts and wouldn't be regulation for property? Who, who in securities has that incentive? Who makes money off of volume, for example? Exchange. Like used to be in the old days, NYC, NASDAQ, Philadelphia Exchange, Chicago Board of Trade, they were all distinct exchanges competing with one another. And one way they could compete about it with one another is different rules for listing and trading. So, for example, I in the NYC, I said, with me, no insider trading rules. You can, anybody can trade. No, no restrictions. NASDAQ says, uh, you know, here are the, here the, here the things that are allowed, here are the things that are not allowed. And let's see which one looks better. Economic. But the idea that you either have government controls or anarchy, chaos, is I think false. Because you have market, the market needs order. And I think that order will come from institutions that the market will create in order to facilitate that order. Exchange is a good example. But we don't just go to coffee shops and any stock. We have to have an exchange that helps us and, and reduces all the information costs and all the transaction costs that involve. But we could also now, for example, it, it could set standards for uh, financial disclosure. It could say, if you want to list at the NYC, you have to abide by these accounting regulations, these accounting rules. And another exchange could do another. Oh, and it could have, if you're this kind of company, these are the accounting rules. If you're this kind of company, that kind of. No, instead of that, we have one set of accounting rules in America. And they apply equally to high tech companies, to old industrial companies, to, to services companies. They all file basically under the same accounting rules, which makes no sense. I remember in Silicon Valley, in the 2000s, there were a series of companies that were issuing two sets of financials every year. One, FASB, of course, you know, and one, what they thought made sense for investors. They stopped doing it because it's too expensive. But you don't get any flexibility with one size fit all government rules, government regulations. So I think there's always, always mechanisms that solve the problems through a market that the government is trying to solve through regulations. And regulations always screw them. Always. Like FDAC is a good idea, right? It sounds pretty good. You, you don't want to have to bother every time you go to the bank to figure out if the bank sold it or not sold it. So you just give the bank the money and the government guarantees the funds and that's right. And it's easy. And what harm does it do? Well, it creates massive more hazard. The, 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 the bank doesn't care about losses because the government's going to bail them out. They only care about the upside. What happens when you care about the upside, don't care about the losses? You take on huge amounts of risk. So banks did that because of deposit insurance, which they have to get. You can't take deposits in unless you have FDIC deposit insurance. Right? So then you have a whole set of regulations limiting the risk taking of banks because they were taking on too much risk. Because of the regulation, it was put in place to protect supposedly deposit, the little guy. How many little guys do you know have two hundred fifty thousand dollars in cash in their bank account? It's never to protect the little guy. Nobody, nobody in Washington cares about the little guy. It's always to protect the big guys who actually can manipulate votes and then they, But it's the control. So regulation say so then you have regulations and risk, and then banks are limited in what they can do. So you have to regulate something else, or you have to impose something else on it. And that's how you get lay up on lay up on lay up on lay up. Now, if you if you work in a bank. You come from that environment. I mean, the amount of regulations is just unbelievable. And some of them conflict with one another. You've got, on the one hand, you've got privacy laws, for example, at a bank. On the other hand, you, you, you have uh, these uh, requirements to let the government know whenever there's a, quote, suspicious activity or anything over $10,000. Now they want to lower that even further. So what do you do? Do you protect the, the privacy of the individual or do you... Let the, well, you have to let the government know it. You're also violating the privacy law. It's another law. So how do you resolve those? Well, banks resolve it by disclosing more. Not disclosing. They care less about your privacy than they do about pissing off the government.
question. You snap your finger and dissolve the fat. Obviously, that would be great. Um, and you get rid of all of these and arbitrary identities. What is the realistic path to towards that end? What, what, where do you start? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know. You know, especially you have to get the right people elected and, and, and the people, the, the people, us, the people you'd be electing would actually have to want a, a dissolution of, of a separation of uh, the government from the economy in some level, and, and we don't have any of that. But assuming we have it, then you would have to figure out a carefully designed path of unwinding these kind of regulations. And it's not easy because if you eliminate uh, the risk controls over banks, which you keep deposit insurance, then banks are going to take up too much risk. That is one simple example. So you have to layer them off in ways that minimizes the risk to the system. And that's very complicated. But I would say, you know, if, 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 you, gave, if you gave me, you know, I, I take a four-year or eight-year program, I'd say every year we do these steps. First of all, you have to be completely transparent. So the market has to know what's coming. So, for example, with regard to the, to, to the Federal Reserve, I would first go on a gold standard and then dissolve the Federal Reserve. So, because the gold standard would give it stability. And, and the way to go on a gold standard is to say, okay, January 1st, 2024, we're going on a gold standard. Whatever the price of gold is that day, or the average over the, first, the last three months or whatever, that is the price in which we're fixing gold. That's the price we're going to use for, for the future for gold. And then once you do that, then now I'm dissolving the Fed. Here's how we're doing it. These are the five steps. This is how we're moving this gold into the pot, all these reserves, which are now in gold, to the banks themselves, and the banks themselves get it. And by the way, banks start planning on having a printer because you're going to actually be printing money to the extent you still have an economy with cash. You're going to actually have to print that cash to figure that out. But here's the date when it's going to happen. And then this, at the same time, in parallel, here are the regulations we're eliminating. Here's the, here, here are the different steps that we're taking in order to get rid of it. All of it would have to be transparent because otherwise, every time you do this, it would be shut to the system and, and, uh, and markets would get you know, freaked out. So you have to do it slowly and systematically. And it has to be over, you know, given the president's elected every four years, it would have to be over a four-year period. You have to have a four-year plan for undoing financial regulation. Four years is... is that's pretty intense to get it done in four years. But you'd have to do the same thing. I mean, my view is you have to get rid of Social Security, you have to get rid of Medicare. One way or another, we're going to. It's just a question of do we do it when they're bankrupt or do we do it when we have time to actually plan for how it looks like? And, and you just have to do the same thing. You can't just come off and say, well, sorry, no Social Security, anybody. You have to say, okay, here's the plan of how we're going to do it. So if you're 20 years old, you don't get it. But if you're 60, you'll probably get most of it. And, and here's how we're going to fund it. And you have to have a... a you know, one of the strategies of our political system is nobody has a plan except to spend money. But beyond that, there's no plan. And when they do come up with some kind of plan, it's usually a hodgepodge of different random stuff that different senators or congressmen stick into the bill in order to get something out of it. But it's not, it doesn't call, even on the left, it doesn't call less into anything other than more power and a greater power than that. So, you need to have a plan, you need to have a, you need to have a strategy, you need to be able to be unbelievably transparent about how you go from point A to point B, because otherwise, otherwise you create chaos. Seems as, as long as politicians have celebrity status, they don't have the incentive to have a plan that or come to the table and we'll ask them. I mean, my, my view is always that we get politics and we deserve it. So we can blame the politicians, but then it is us. We don't demand a plan. I mean, look at Republicans running this last time. Did they have a positive message? Was there something that you knew that if you vote for a Republican, this is what they were going to do other than ban abortion? But this is what they were going to do? What they said, Biden's bad on inflation. Okay, what are you going to do about inflation? Silence. He did all these bad things. What would you have done if you were there? We know what Trump would have done. What would you have done if you were back there? Don't even ask the question. Right? Um, uh, crime. Crime is rampant because people are the police, Democrats, whatever. These are national Republicans. Okay, what are you going to do about it? What are the actual steps that you plan to do to reduce crime in America? None. Uh, you know, compare that 
to make one of the most successful, I think, Republican um, uh, Congresses, which is the, the 1994 kind of uh, uh, New Gingrich Revolution, right? It was a contract with America. I didn't agree with much of it, but at least you knew this is what they stood for. This is what they believed. This is what positively they were going to do. And this time, if you'd ask McConnell or McCarthy, what about a contract? No, 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 we don't, we don't actually present a positive view. And we went and we go vote for the bastards anyway. So I'm kind of happy that they had a bad night yesterday, even though I hate the Democrats as much as anybody. I'm glad because somebody had to slap them in the face and tell them what you're doing is silly. And the electorate has to do that. Who else is going to do it? So, uh, you know, there's, what does the Republican Party stand for? Too? We know what the Democrats kind of stand for. What do the Republicans stand for? Particularly post-Trump. I don't think anybody knows what they stand for. So we, the people, have to demand better and have to expect better. Um, and uh, only then will we get better politics. We, we won't get it by chance. I mean, an accident might happen. Uh, but I, I mean, I think Ronald Reagan got elected, who I think was better, a little bit better at least, because the culture had shifted. Because it was a real shift. People demanded something different. They were so fed up with Jimmy Carter, what had happened in the 70s and inflation in the 70s, that they wanted something different. They were willing to experiment. And, and Reagan was kind of a, okay, let's go. In a sense, they did that with Trump. But the gulf between Trump and, and the Reagan was huge because Trump said, I'm not going to tell you how I'm going to fix all the problems with Costco. And we said, yes, great, because the real estate developer must know what he's doing. And when Reagan actually laid out a Reagan actually had a vision. And Reagan actually told you what he stood for and what he was going to do and what he wanted to do. And again, I disagree with much of the plan, but at least he had a plan. He had some kind of vision. And so we won't get changed until we demand our politicians uh, stand for something and actually be willing to communicate what that is. That's going to be a big difference. Final question? Why group? Let me say the uh, oh, okay. uh, So, not on the topic of inflation, but on the topic of the minimal state. Yeah. Uh, does the Minarchus for some sort of minimal state, does it have a standing army? And how does it stop that standing army from becoming a government? Yeah. So, I don't, first of all, I don't like the sort of uh, it seems bad. So, I mean, I'm for limited government. I don't even like small government. Limited government is the right conception. And limited by individual rights. That's, that's the purpose of it. Does it have a standing army? I think in the end of the day, it depends who you are, right? Uh, you know, if, if uh, some countries can afford not to have standing armies, some countries cannot afford to have not have. And I think the United States, given where it is geographically and, and given kind of its ambitions needed the standing arm. Um, but this is the challenge. How do you fund a standing arm? And this is, I think, what keeps a, a uh, what in a truly limited government perspective, my kind of government, would keep, would restrain it, is to, to make it a limited, you know, a standing army of only so, so much size and not a limited size, is that I think that ultimately, uh, Funding for such an army would have to be in some form voluntary. That is, that it was would not be coast of taxation. Because if it's coast of taxation, then yeah, got, there's a massive incentive to grow that army to, and to keep growing that. And it's very difficult for us to organize if they're increasing our taxes just a little bit. It's 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 too incremental. And as the economy grows, remember if the, if the tax is 10%. And the economy's grown a lot, then they're getting a lot more money. For what? You know, you think that actually um, what they need on a year to year basis stays about the same. It doesn't have to grow. But if you make contributions to support the military policy, which I know sounds bizarre, but imagine a world in which we all wrote checks to the government for the for the army. Then A, you would depending on your view about military, you would support it more or less. Um, but if they were engaged in a war you didn't support, you would stop supporting it. They would get less money. 
um, if, uh, uh, if, if, if the army needed to expand, they would have to make the case there to actually convince you of, make, of, of the need to grow the military. Uh, I think it, it would become much more um, sensitive to our wants as uh, citizens rather than to the powers to be and their ambitions. Um, but, you know, the United States arguably has, it devotes a huge amount of its money uh, to a standing army and uh, today, and that's partially because we've taken on the mission of defending the entire world. And that's not a mission I think most Americans actually want. So one thing I agreed with Trump on was, I mean, the Europeans contribute almost nothing to their own defense. We basically protect them. They're free riding off of us. Why? Why should the United States even be in NATO? I mean, I understand Europeans want a united defense to protect themselves against mainly Russia, but why, why do we need to be part of it? Because we have the money? Because we're willing to do it? Because the President of the United States has a lot of power if he does? So if the politicians have any incentive to be part of a NATO? But uh, does it really protect the lives and property of American citizens? Skeptical. And uh, I think we'd have, we could have a smaller army if we didn't have to have bases in 120, 50 countries around the world. And I bet you that of 120, less than 20 actually have to do with the security of Americans. And the rest have to do with meddling in other people's affairs. Primarily, uh, you know, increasing our politicians power over other countries and power over global that have little to do with protecting us. So uh, how do you protect the government, uh, the military from taking over ultimately, and what, even if it's small? You know, the only way to protect it is to have such a great country, and I think you would, that the people would rebel against such a military, and the military would never want to do it because they would do it. There's, just, there's no mechanism you can build in that to protect you from every crazy occurrence. You know, people can do bad things. Bad things will happen. And uh, you want to minimize those. And I think a system that has a very limited government constitution very clearly defines the role of government. I think ours is pretty good, but I think it would be a lot better at defining the scope of government, limiting government appropriately, defining it. I mean, it would be nice if individual rights were defined in the constitution. And then explicitly said that the role of government is to protect individual rights and not do anything else. That would have saved us a lot of damage over the last 250 years. Um, but the founders, the logic, they thought that was something. They, they just assumed it was in the water, right? It was in, they were meant to be laying. This was just part of the cultural environment in which they lived. They couldn't imagine a world in which we have no concept of what individual rights are. I mean, literally, in 99% of law schools, they don't know what individual rights mean. Indeed, they, most conceptions of rights are false. Are not certainly not what the founders meant when the Declaration of the Constitution was written. How many Supreme Court justices today sitting on the Supreme Court think that the, uh, that the Declaration of Independence is important for understanding the Constitution? One. Thomas. That's it. Only a Supreme Court judge that thinks that the two have any relevance. And, and Scalia didn't think they had any relevance. Scalia thought individual rights were nonsense on stilts. That's a great conservative Supreme Court judge thought individual rights, the founding concept of the American idea, the whole basis for the forming of the American government, that concept, that walking concept, was according to Bentham and Scalia, nonsense on stilts. So yeah, you know, we've got a long, long path to go. Just to resurrect the ideas of the founders, never mind to uh, modernize them and to, bring, and to take the lessons of the last 250 years and, and apply them to a modern constitution. Yeah. Uh, you have time for one more question. I can go on all day. <laughs> uh, what are your what's your outlook for the next call it two, three years? Some people say short smile of recessions and Oh, you can not have it. Yeah, well, we'll oh, we're going to have a recession next year. I don't think there's a way out of that. Uh, this idea that the Fed can engineer a soft landing is, again, a belief in central planners' ability to do stuff that just doesn't exist. Uh, it, this is an organization that didn't see the inflation coming. Why would we believe that they could undo it in a smooth way? So we're going to have a recession. 
I mean, the two question, questions, how deep is the recession going to be? And then is the recession going to be enough to kill inflation? Because people forget that in the early 1970s, we had inflation. The Fed raised interest rates. And we had a recession. And inflation went down. And the Fed lowered interest rates. And inflation went back up. And it went like this until Volcker finally raised interest rates. Forced the U.S. into a deep recession, a very strong deep recession. But the only reason I think inflation was actually killed during the Volcker years is not because of Volcker. He did what he was going to say. But at the same time, Ronald Reagan, the tax reform, or at least uh, made changes to the tax code in 1982. And Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan completely deregulated the economy. Massive deregulation under Jimmy Carter and then under Reagan. And what does that do? That frees up supply. So if, if, if inflation is this mismatch of demand and supply, one way to fix it is to liberate supply. And by deregulating, you increase supply, prices stabilize. And this is the role of the, of the federal government in inflation. Feds, deregulate, but I don't know of a single senator, well, maybe I know three senators who think that the U.S. government should deregulate on a, a scale. Maybe Rand Paul, maybe only Rand Paul. I mean, in the old days, they would say maybe Ted Cruz or maybe Lee, but I don't believe they care about anything anymore um, uh, after they, after you know, the way they wobbled to Trump. So uh, I think it's Rand Paul. He, you know, he wobbled to Trump too. But so nobody believes in deregulation. But today, what, what you'd have to do is you need to spike in interest rates and then you need to deregulate and cut government spending. No way that's happening. So I wouldn't be surprised if we had a recession and we continued to have inflation after it. So we, we, we could, we, we, it looks like we're going to mimic the 1970s. Nobody wants to learn the lesson. Um, and nobody has the political courage to learn the lesson, to actually do what's necessary. Now, I thought maybe if Republicans won, hopefully they win the House. I hope Republicans win the House. Because that will at least stop. I think the one thing Republicans are good at it, when they're in the opposition is they tend to reduce spending. What they do is they, they cut a deal with the president, the Democratic president, to, uh, that if he wants to get anything done, that he has to you know, freeze spending or cut spending or cut it as a percentage of GDP or something. And, and that would be good for inflation. If the market sees government is not growing at the same pace as it was growing before, that would be good in terms of inflation. Um, so that's a one thing, and I think Republicans will probably win the House. So I think I think that that'll be a good signal. The deregulation is not going to happen, certainly not under Biden. And I don't know who the Republican president will be who will deregulate. Although people say DeSantis is a uh, Reaganite, um, you know, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. Uh, and and then. Um, yeah, and then we'll see if Powell has the courage to take this where it needs to go. He seemed, uh, give him credit, he, he, he's saying the right things, right? Uh, he's, he's saying the right things. He's saying we'll continue to raise as high as necessary. But saying it and doing it another thing. So, so we'll see what kind of political pressure he comes under. Once there's a recession, there's unemployment, and people are upset, and people are unhappy, and it's all the Fed's fault, and all the leftist economists say, no, you never need to raise interest rates. At all, inflation is going to die by itself. I mean, we're hearing that already now. So the pressure will mount on you. So, uh, so it, it, you know, predictions are hard, short term predictions, and sent the harder the long term predictions. But I do expect a recession, and I fear that it won't be enough in terms of ending inflation, because I think inflation might be more systemic than what they think. And let's other stuff. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Um, great.